do it by myself. Amen. Amen. James chapter 3. I also give honor to my pastor. I know that he's on preaching. and appreciate all that he does for me. James chapter number 3. The Bible says that, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. He says, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small ham, whithersoever the governor listeth. He says, Even though the tongue is a little member, it boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body. And it setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. He said, for every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and things in the sea. He says, we can tame them. But the tongue, no man can tame. You know, when I read that verse, I often think it's kind of ironic. That when God chose to issue the initial sign that somebody has received the Spirit of God, it was that they speak in other tongues. Because no fleshly humanistic effort can tame the tongue. Only the Spirit can do that. He says, therewith we bless God, even the Father, and then we curse men which are made after the similitude of God. He said, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing he says my brethren it should not be this way and then he finishes with a question he says can a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter water or can the fig tree my brethren bear olive berries either fine a vine figs no no fountain can yield both salt water and fresh so for the next few moments i want to preach for you from a very simple subject that is the value of a voice. Turn to somebody and say, your voice has value. Turn to somebody else and say, no, really, it has value. Amen. Give somebody a high five and you may be seated. There was a Greek philosopher who once invited a group of very esteemed guests over to his house. And he said, I'm going to make a deal with you. He said, on the first night that I invite you over, I'm going to feed you the best meal that you've ever eaten in your entire life. He said, but on the second night that you come, I'm going to feed you the worst meal that you've ever eaten. Would anybody take that deal? Depends on how hungry you are. As they arrived at the house the first night, they made their place to the table. Everybody got their seat. The servants came out and set the table. They arrayed it all nicely. They put the main entree in the middle of the table. They lifted the lid. And to everybody's amazement, the main entree was smothered tongue. Now, I don't know how hungry you've ever been, but I've never eaten tongue. Not a human tongue. Now, where I live, if you can shoot it with a gun, most likely you can eat it. So I have eaten cow tongue. Has anybody ever eaten that? I can always tell when I'm in a place kind of similar to Bogalusa because more people raise their hand. I preached in New Orleans one time and I asked everybody that and I don't think anybody raised their hand. But I, I arrived to the church one day and the gentleman said, Brother Drew, I've made some cow tongue. Uh, would you like to try it? And I said, well, not really. He said, well, it tastes just like roast. And I said, well, why don't we just eat roast? <laughs> you see, I passed by the fields, and I've seen what cows do with their tongue. But he assured me that he cleaned it, and he cooked it, and all was well. I ate it one time, and that'll probably be the last time. But these guests were at the table, and they're looking at the host, and they say, you know, I'm kind of flabbergasted because you said you were going to feed us the best meal of our lives. Why are we about to eat tongue? And he said, because your tongue is what you use to bless people. It's what you use to communicate happiness and dismiss sorrow. He said, the tongue is used to uplift the discouraged and to encourage the faint heart. He said, the tongue is, that is why that is the best possible meal in the world. So the next night they show up and they're wondering and they're looking at each other and they're saying, if the tongue was the best meal in the world, I wonder what could be the worst meal in the world. 
So they took their seat on the second night. The servants once more came and set the table. They set the main entree in the middle of the table. They lifted the lid, and would you know it, for the second night in the row, smothered tongue. Everybody's kind of looking around, you know, it was a free meal, so you're not really supposed to gripe at the free store, so I've been taught. So they're looking around and they're wondering, like, why in the world has he fed his tongue two nights in a row? And so finally somebody was brave enough to raise their hand and they said, sir, I have a question. You told us that on the first night you would feed us the best meal in the world. And you said on the second night you would feed us the worst meal in the world. And they said, but on both nights you had fed us tongue. How is the tongue the worst? meal in the world he said because the tongue is what breaks hearts it destroys reputation it promotes discord it starts wars and sometimes it even causes divorce this Greek philosopher was explaining what the Bible already teaches that our mouths and our voices they can either be used for good or they can be used for the bad one writer said that the second most deadly instrument in, of destruction in the world is the dynamite gun because the first is the human tongue. Because a gun can only kill a body, but the tongue can destroy reputation and all time ruin a character. Each gun works alone, but every loaded tongue has many accomplices. He says the havoc of the gun is only seen at once, but the havoc of the tongue lives on for years. Words are singularly the most powerful force available to humanity. We can choose choose to use this force constructively with words of encouragement or we can destructively use it with words of despair our words have the energy and the power they can either help heal or they can hinder hurt harm humiliate or humble gary chapman said it like this that words are either seeds or they're bullets they either go and they produce life or they go and they produce death that's why James said in our opening text that a fountain cannot provide sweet water and bitter water. He says a fig tree cannot provide two types of fruit. He said an olive tree can't provide figs. He said, but the tongue is so powerful that it can do what even nature cannot do. He says your tongue is so powerful that it can curse one person and turn around and bless somebody else. He says your tongue is so powerful that you can speak life to somebody on your left and then turn to your right and speak death. You can help somebody one minute and then you can hurt someone the next. He said that's why the tongue is so powerful. Therefore we must guard with everything in our hearts what we speak with our mouth. We must be a church and we must be a people that would be intentional about speaking life and not death. We will speak light and not darkness. We will be of an encouragement spirit and we will not be the one that would discourage people. I want to be the voice of mercy and never the voice of judgment. I want to sound like the voice of Christ and never the voice of the accuser. That's why Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 18 that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Because there is great power in what we say. Therefore, we must be specific in what we speak. Understand, we only get through two verses in the Bible before God starts speaking. The Bible says in Genesis 1 and 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 1 says over 15 times, and God said, illustrating to us that there is creative power in what we say. When God decided to create the world, he used words. Everything that was created was initiated by the spoken word of God. God created the world, not by rolling up his sleeves, but by opening up his mouth. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke, and then he saw what he spoke. When we speak, we can produce what we see. Logic says you have to see it to speak it. But faith says you can speak it to see it. Because there is great power in what we say. The land was separated from the water. Not because God started digging, but because God started speaking. And Hebrews takes it a step further and says that the world is upheld by the word of God. Because there is 
power in our voices. Understand, it's not just the voice of God that has power. Because if we believe that we truly are spirit-filled, what that means is that the, cre the God, the creator, that came in flesh, and then now he dwells in us in the spirit. That means within our mortal bodies possesses great power. That's when we open up our mouths and speak. It can be either really good or really bad. Because it's not just God that has his power and his divine palate, but likewise, regular men and women, boys and girls, we have power within what we say. It's in everybody that's in here. Understand the scripture did not say that death and life are only in some tongues. You don't get to a certain age when your voice begins to be powerful. That's why there can be a little Sunday school baby that can stand up and say, God spoke to me and it can come to pass because there's no age limit on a voice. But when God God speaks. Somebody say my voice is valuable. Ezekiel was standing in the valley of dry bones. And the Lord visited Ezekiel and said, Ezekiel, can these bones live again? And Ezekiel looked back at God and said what I probably would have said. Well, God, you tell me. And so this is what God tells Ezekiel. He said, this is what I want you to do in 37 of 4. He said unto me, prophesy to the bones. And he says, oh, ye dry bones, hear ye the word of the Lord. God told Ezekiel, the miracle is in your mouth. And when you begin to speak to the dryness, it'll come back to life. God, God then tells Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy to the wind. So the Bible says six verses later, so I prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them and they lived and they stood up on their feet and exceeding great army. Now watch this. I don't know how long it's been since you've been in science class and you looked at a skeleton, but they don't have ears. Your ears are not bones, it's tissue. So when Ezekiel was prophesying to bones, he was prophesying to something that doesn't even have ears. And some of you are here today and you've got some dead dry situations. Maybe you've got some kids that are backslid and you feel like they can't hear you. Let me tell you, Ezekiel was able to prophesy to bones and it became an army. Don't ever stop praying for your kids. Don't ever stop praying for revival. Don't ever stop praying for your spouse. Because when you speak, it's powerful. That's why if you are a parent, every day get up and prophesy over your kids. They're going to be great. God's going to use you. God's going to anoint you. You're not going to backslide. You're not going to be lost. You're going to be mighty. If Ezekiel can prophesy to bones, you can prophesy to your situation. Right now, I want everybody to lift your hands and lift your voice. And I want you to begin to speak to your situation. I know you feel like he can't hear you. I know you feel like it's never going to change. I know you feel like it's never going to be any different. But I want you to hear me. It's locked up within your voice. Don't be silent. Speak. Ha. <laughs> ha. Somebody say my voice. It's locked up within your voice. God told Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy to the bones. Now watch this. Listen, he did not say, I want you to pray to me about the bones. He said, Ezekiel, I want you to speak directly to the bones. And Jesus continued this in the New Testament, Mark chapter 11. For he said, Verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say to the mountain, it's our nature to feel like that we must go to God in prayer and ask him for everything. And I understand, I understand where that comes from. But God has given us the authority. Sometimes we don't ask. Sometimes we speak. You see, sometimes you can't ask depression to leave. You've got to get sick and tired of it and say, depression, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Sometimes you can't ask the enemy to leave. You've just got to stand up and say, you've attacked my family long enough. You've attacked my it's long enough. You've attacked my children long enough. In the name of Jesus. 
Sometimes we pray about the bones, but sometimes we got to speak right to it. Because when we speak in faith, it changes our situation. Our words are so powerful that they can literally shape our lives. The children of Israel were given a promise from God, a land that would flow with milk and honey. The promised land was theirs for the taking. But 10 men started talking. And because 10 men spoke out, they wandered for 40 years. And I have decided that if my speech can alter my story and my conversation can become the context of my life, then I will choose to speak what thus saith the Lord. Because when our declaration has his authorization and our words align with his word and our speech is backed up by the scripture, it's powerful. Do you believe that? Do you believe that your words and your voice can literally change your entire situation? And I understand we're human and I understand we go through things that we feel like we don't deserve. We get caught up in situations we never asked to be in. We're innocent people caught in the crossfire. I understand that. But I want to come and give somebody some encouragement today. When you don't have the words and you don't know what to say, the, ba the best thing for you to say is to get in the word of God and don't start declaring what he's already said. If you're sick and you don't see a way out, you can declare that by his strikes I am healed when you feel like you're defeated you can declare I am an overcomer through Jesus Christ because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world because it's one thing to read the word it's an entirely different thing to speak the word I believe it's powerful for us to release the word of God into the atmosphere. Not just read it. You see, because when we read it, it's just us in the word. But when we speak it, it goes into our situation. And when we speak it, we release it into the atmosphere. That's why it's great for parents to get up in your home. I don't have any children yet, but I still walk the hallways of my home. And I say, God, this is going to be a holy place. This is going to be a place that if I have children one day, the presence of the Lord is going to be here. God, I rebuke anything that would try to come into my house that would hurt my marriage I rebuke anything that would try to come into my house that would hurt my wife and I speak the word over my house when Jesus was tempted of the devil three times the Bible says that Jesus spoke to the enemy what thus saith the word of the Lord he would tell the devil it is written and when you unleash the power of God's word through your voice, you literally have the ability to evict evil and invite the supernatural. Because watch this. When Jesus looked at the devil and said, it is written, the Bible says that the devil left and angels showed up. And when we begin to release it into our homes, into our lives, depression starts leaving and joy starts coming. We begin to rebuke suicide and life starts coming. We begin to rebuke the darkness and then the light shows up. Because when you unleash your voice, it's powerful. I've come to help somebody today. This is no time to be silent. If you've got a voice, use it. We live in a world, understand, that pushes their agenda so proudly and so loudly. And in the world that's speaking what they want to say, the church cannot be silent. We must refuse silence. The scripture says that the dead praise not the Lord, neither them that go down in silence. In the battle of Jericho, they marched for six days silently, but the walls never fail until somebody shouted. Because wall never fall, walls never fall because of silence. But I have seen walls fall because of a voice. I cannot tell you how many times I have come into a worship service and I would be feeling beat down and I would be feeling discouraged. I was the only one in my family that went to church. And sometimes it was all I could do to get to church. And then when I got there, I didn't feel like being there. I may have been depressed. I may have been down and out. But I can't tell you how many times when I started standing up and I started worshiping 
worshiping God that my situation started to change. And then I realized I don't have to be depressed. I don't have to feel alone because I'm not alone. Because when you begin to open up your mouth, it changes your situation. That's why when we worship, it's more than just saying a few words. We're inviting the presence of God to come down where we're at. That's the power of your voice. One more time, I want everybody to lift your hands. I want you to lift your voice. Uh, There's power, and when you do that, Come on, when you sing a praise, you're doing more than just making noise. When you worship God, you're doing more than just going through the routine. You're inviting the presence of Almighty God down to where you're at. There's victory in your voice. It was Paul and Silas who lifted their voices from the inner prison and it grabbed the attention of God. And the Bible says there was a great earthquake and everybody's pants were loose. Sometimes your praise might not only help you, but it'll help your neighbor because there's power in your voice. God synchronized his deliverance with their voice. I often wonder what would have happened if it would have said and at midnight Paul and Silas did nothing. Because I've learned that if I'll do my part, God always does his part. There was an Italian engineer. He was accredited with inventing the radio. And he thought that he could build a machine to go back in time to hear sound. Because this is what he thought. He thought that sound never dies. He submitted to the world that sound never dies. It just goes to a place in the atmosphere that we can no longer hear it. Unfortunately, he never built that machine. It was his dream to hear the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus Christ. While I don't believe that you can build a machine to go back in time to hear sound, here's what I do believe, that prayers never die. Because the Bible said they're stored in golden vials in heaven. But I've got a revelation for myself one day that God can't answer prayers that I don't pray. So I prayed that it would never be my silence for the reason that God's not working. So every opportunity I get, I want to use my voice as an avenue to let God know this is what I need. I ask our youth group all the time, what would be different in the world if God answered every prayer you prayed in the last seven days? Would anybody be saved? Would anybody be delivered? Or would you just be better off? Everybody said my voice is powerful. Wilma Rudolph was born in, say, Bethlehem, Tennessee. She was number 20 of 22 children. They need two church vans to get to church. She grew up in extreme poverty, and she had a, a terrible encounter with sickness. By the age of 12, she experienced double pneumonia, polio, scarlet fever, measles, and chicken pox. And through all of these sicknesses, she experienced a crippled leg that caused her to wear braces. The doctors would often tell her, you're never going to walk again. But her mom would always tell her, you will walk again. And at age 16, at the 1956 Olympics, Wilma Rudolph won a bronze medal, the youngest member of the team in track and field while still in high school. And then four years later at the 1960 Olympics in Rome, she won three gold medals, all while breaking three world records in the process. She went on to be female of the year and to get inducted into the Olympic Hall of Fame. And she is considered by many as the greatest female track and field athlete of all time. Wilma went on to tell about her sickness-filled childhood and how she had to wear the braces and how she, the doctors would always tell her, you're never going to walk again. And then they asked Wilma how she overcame. And she said, because the voice of my mother always outweighed the voice of the doctor. She said, the doctors would always tell me I would be crippled. But my mom would always tell me, you're not going to be crippled. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that the church is the mother of us all. And there are going to be people from this community. They're going to come in those back doors and they're going to be like Wilma Rudolph. They may not have a crippled leg, but on the inside they're crippled. And there's a world telling them, you're always going to be addicted. You're always going to be broken. But they need a church in the other year saying, let me tell you about Jesus. 
Do you want God to send you the broken of your community? Come on. Is this a church that believes? We don't care what color they are. We don't care what's wrong with them. We don't care what they're addicted to. We've got a God that can bring them out. I wish everybody would stand to your feet right now and begin to lift your voice and let God know, God, send us the broken, send us the maimed, send us the whole. Come on, there's a world telling people you're always going to be pound. You're always going to be broken. You're always going to be addicted. But there's got to be a church that would tell somebody, Jesus is greater than alcohol. Jesus is greater than drugs. Our world needs a church with a voice. Because they're coming, I'm telling you. Last night and this morning in prayer, I felt it in my spirit. There, there's, I was here last February 2017. And from then until now, the church is totally different. When I walked in this morning, I told pastor, I feel something in this house. There's a shift coming. But here's the deal. We don't get to pick who God sends when God gives us revival. So when they come in and they sit on the chair and they don't look like us and they're broken and they got all of these problems, what they need is a church that says Jesus loves you and wants to change your life. You have the power to speak into somebody's life and it changes everything. There's a world that's always going to bring them down and tear them down, but they need a church with a voice. We could all stay standing. I'm almost finished. Last year when I came, I preached about God's impossibility. I was 19 years old when I got into church. God came to me in a dream in July of 2010 and said, Drew, your family's going to be lost. And I saw pictures of my family falling into this pit of lava. I saw faces. My mom, my stepdad, my siblings, my friends falling. And the Lord spoke to me in that dream. The first time God's ever really spoken to me. He said, this is what's going to happen to them if you don't serve me. I woke up, as I told you last year, I woke up. And I said, okay, God, I went to church. God filled me with the Holy Ghost July the 4th, 2010. One month later, I was baptized. I started living for God. I told you that when I was here last time. But last year, when I came in February up to that point, I have been able to witness to my friends, baptize both of them and one of their wives. But I want to tell you what God's done in the last year. Because now my grandmother has been filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name. She was in a coma for three months this past year. They called me. They said she's been in a coma. They, they tried to do all kind of tests to get her to, to, to see if she would respond to any kind of stimulant. And they said she won't respond to anything. And I went in there and I prayed. And I said, God, you can't let her go yet. She's not ready to meet you. All of a sudden, her eyes started twitching. And the doctor said, we haven't seen her move in days. But I went into that hospital room and I began to release my voice. And it's not, it's not me, it's God who's in me. <laughs> then last year, last summer, in the month of June, I baptized my mom in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> then I baptized my stepdad in the name of Jesus Christ. I have a half sister. I have a half sister who is a single mother. And she called me. She said, their dad's not involved in their life. I'm broken. You know what I told her? God can help you. She came to church. She started coming, her and her babies. I prayed with her. I baptized her in the name of Jesus. I was praying with her in the altar when she received the Holy Ghost. Single mom of two kids. This past summer, I walked her down the aisle. Our father died when I was just a a junior in high school. I walked her down the aisle, and she married a young man in the church who also came from a broken life. And now today, they're at home in our local church. They're in youth service every Wednesday night helping me. Why? Because somebody said, I know a way out. Because I was willing to lift my voice and let my sister know Jesus is greater than all of your fears. Jesus is greater than your loneliness. Jesus is greater than your pain. 
And in the month of June, I had my cousin Aaron and his wife were methamphetamine addicts, crack cocaine, heroin. He's almost overdosed twice. He went to prison last year. I would go visit him. And you know what I would do? We would talk on the phone through that glass screen. And I would just begin to release my voice into that jail. And I would tell him, God can take this addiction away from you. The state that came in and took both of their kids because they said you're not fit for, to, to raise any kids. He had weighed about 270. When he got on drugs, he started weighing about 170 pounds. Twice he almost overdosed. He got out of prison, went to rehab. He called me. He said, man, I went to rehab, but I know I'm missing something. They started coming to church. They had gained their weight back. They had got off of drugs. The, the state had given, given them their kids back. He said, uh, you know, I feel like there's more to this. They had been coming. I said, oh, there is. So we had a Bible study on a Saturday night in the month of June this year, just a few months ago. And as they sat across the table for me, I watched tears begin to roll down their face as they got the revelation of Jesus' name, baptism. And in that Bible study, I explained to them, when you go down in the name of Jesus, there's no sin greater than the blood. Drugs aren't greater than the blood. I somebody needs to hear me. There is nothing greater than the blood of Jesus. Come on, I've come to let somebody know you're not too far gone. You're not in a valley too low where the hand of Jesus can't pick you up. And as they begin to cry, they say, can you baptize us? The very next morning, I baptized him and his wife in the name of Jesus. The very next week, I had to go up for youth camps. I was elected youth secretary this year, and so I had to go up and do some work. And I called my pastor because I would miss that Sunday night service. And I said, Pastor, I feel in my spirit. If you make a push for people to receive the Holy Ghost, that Aaron and Hope will receive it. I went to, to the campgrounds that, that night and did all of my work. I was on my way to eat. It was 7.30. My phone rang. It was FaceTime, my pastor. And I knew that he was supposed to be preaching about that time. So I wasn't going to answer. I thought maybe it was an accident. But something told me to answer. And when I answered it, it was somebody standing at the altar. And my cousin and his wife were standing right there. And pastor was right there. And he said, Drew, I just wanted you to see this. Aaron and Hope are about to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They have been strung out on meth and crack and heroin for over three years. They almost lost their lives several times. But I watched on FaceTime as he laid hands on Aaron. And he received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then he laid hands on his wife. And they both begin to speak in tongues. Why? Because somebody with a voice said, let me tell you who Jesus is. I was with him yesterday. Him and his wife are going through discipleship class. We had a 24-hour prayer chain at our church. He did one of the slots. He said, man, I've never prayed for an hour, but it felt like it went by like that. God's changing his life. Both of his kids are coming to church. Why? Because somebody with a voice was willing to use it. Because your voice is valuable. That's why we must choose to speak life. But everybody lift your hands right now. Come on, I feel the Lord coming in to minister to some people. I want to I reach for somebody that maybe you feel like you messed up too bad. Maybe you're here today and you've never received the Holy Ghost. And you say, I want to find out what that's about. You can get it. We're all going to come and pray just a moment. But right now, I need somebody beginning to lift your voice. Come on, let's shift the atmosphere right now. I want somebody to hear me. It doesn't matter how much you messed up. There's a God that can forgive you. It doesn't matter how much you sin. There's a God that can bring you out. There's, there's not enough sin in your life that Jesus cannot fix.